Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. And our topic is the rule of God. And we've been studying what the New Testament teaches about the rule of God, that's God's personal rule in our lives through faith in Christ, through the Sermon on the Mount. And we've come to the point in the Sermon on the Mount when we're looking at the Beatitudes, those blessed attitudes. We've spent some programs looking at how these attitudes work in our lives and how we can get closer and closer to God as we develop those attitudes in our heart and in our spirit. We've been looking at the, the blessed attitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they shall see the kingdom of God. And now we're going deeper to look at the next blessed attitude, which is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This kind of spiritual mourning is a recognition that in our relationship with God, we're utterly poverty stricken, but God opens the doors to his riches in our lives. We should mourn for our polluted planet. Don't you just grieve when you see the effects of pollution and the effects of what we have done to this planet, destruction of rainforests, poisoning the atmosphere, the arms sail, the filling of the rivers with pesticides. All these things are an offense to God, you know, because we have we are destroying his gift of creation. We should mourn for human injustice, for debt. I mourn for the debt of the third world nations, the unfair trade practices, the homelessness, the refugees, the deaths that come through war, the way we treat the unborn with abortion, millions and millions of children with a life just as valuable in God's eyes as Jeremiah, whom God of whom God said, before you were born, I formed you in the womb. Prisoners who have nowhere to go, I don't just mean that they shouldn't be imprisoned because of their crimes, but who is going to minister to them and see them changed, mentally ill, the elderly. We should mourn about social unrest, the social fragmentation of our lives, the love of materialism, which is the root of all evil. We should mourn our neighbor's apathy towards God, the way our society is against God. That very, very poignant verse of Psalm 119, verse 136, the psalmist says, Rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. When you see people breaking the law of God, when you see whole television programs and movies made out of that whole, uh, made out of the commission of sin, committing sin. Let me tell you something. If they had to commit sin to film that movie, to make that program, how can you watch it? And I'm not talking about those movies which record the, 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 that sins have been committed and d show the consequences of those in a godly way. And there are some movies like that, not many of them, because they're made by non-Christians who are unregenerate, who don't know poverty of spirit, who won't mourn over sin. They may feel very upset when they see gross sins and crimes and things, they may be upset, but they're not mourning, because you see, this mourning is in, is, is in respect of your relationship with God. Rivers of water, tears flow down my, from my cheeks because your law is not obeyed. Not just that people are getting hurt, but God is being sinned against. Sin is primarily and ultimately against God. 
It's a sin against him. He is the one who is being offended and sinned against more than anything else at a human level. And when you see the desperation of man's inhumanity against man, and you see the, the terrible results of man's sins and crimes that he commits against himself and against his fellow man, fellow brother, fellow mankind, when you see that and see how terrible that is, that should give you some beginnings of a measure of how sin affects God. Cannot entertain sin in your life. You must mourn for it. And when you do this, you're well on the way to genuine metanoia, genuine repentance. You're well on your way to genuine forsaking sin and all the attitudes that give rise to it because it's the deceitfulness of sin that keeps you there. It's the deceitfulness of sin that draws you away from Jesus, promising you something, but cannot deliver it. And when you recognize that sin does not satisfy, that sin robs, that sin shames, then you have changed your mind about sin. And the right reaction to it is to mourn that you ever had it and then move out of it because your mind has changed. That's genuine metanoia, change of mind, genuine repentance. Now he says, God rewards mourners. Hallelujah. Have you ever mourned the fact that your life is still ungodly in many ways? And have you ever longed for something to be different? I'm not just talking about those wish thoughts. Oh, I wish I was as righteous as this. I wish I was holy. Because you are as holy as you wish to be. But I'm talking about in your struggle against sin and the, the sense of that sin which pulls you like a magnet to draw you away from Jesus. And you resist it and say no to it, but you still mourn. Why is it that I still seem so alive to it when I've been crucified with Christ. When you mourn like that, do you know what your comfort is going to be? God's going to wipe the tears from your eyes. He's going to tell you about a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. He's going to tell you about a resurrection in which you are going to be raised to, to life eternal out of the very presence of sin. He's going to tell you about the day when sin is going to be removed from you completely and in the future. Then also in the present, he's going to tell you about the power of Jesus to break sin in your life now that you can rise up and lead a holy life set free from the bondage of sin. Hallelujah! Blessed are those who mourn. They are going to be comforted. They're going to be comforted with the power of the Holy Ghost to strengthen you, lift you above your weakness, and give you victory over sin. Oh yes, you mourn today. You'll be happy tomorrow. God will give joy. Psalm 30, verse 5. His anger is but for a moment. His favor lasts for the night. His, his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes, for, comes in the morning. I'm so excited I can hardly say it. Are you going through a time of mourning now? I'm not just talking about mourning the loss of a loved one. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm talking about the mourning of the, the loss of a loved one. I am mourning the loss of Colin Dye. I loved him greatly. I loved him dearly. In fact, he was always on my mind. That's the nature of sin, isn't it? And thank God I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. 
That's the joy. If you know the pain of crucifixion, you're going to know the joy of resurrection. Godly sorrow ends in godly joy. Now are you ready to come high up the mountain with me? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The third beatitude, blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Can you see now? It's getting higher. We now, the promises are getting stronger. The challenge is stronger too, because you see, meekness is spiritual poverty and spiritual mourning translated into an attitude towards other people. Now, when you're dealing with yourself, it's one thing. But when you're dealing with somebody else, it's completely different. Contrary to popular psychological opinion, it's easier to forgive others than it is to forgive yourself. And even the inability to forgive yourself is based on the love of yourself, if you analyze it. But today in the world, we have another message. As battles rage, and nations or people or groups try to assert supremacy over one part of the earth or another, many people believe that might is right and might will triumph in the end. But Jesus knows something different. It's the meek who will inherit the earth. It won't be inherited through missiles, international boundaries, borders, world trade, manipulation. It won't be conquered that way. Well, it may be conquered that way, but it will not be inherited that way. world control, universal authority, possession of this planet, all these things will not be given to the strong and powerful in themselves. All these things will be given to those who are meek. That's the promise of the kingdom of God. We will rule and reign with Christ over this earth and over the universe. Well, it seems absurd. It's the absolute reverse of your human experience. It's the biggest boys who get to the front of the queue. It's the bullies who win. Well, unless a bigger bully comes and deals with them. Well, God says, I want you to think differently. Trouble is, most churches agree with the world and their attitudes. Meekness is missing from our vocabulary. It's missing from our pulpits, perhaps both in sermon form and in practical living form. Just as soon as somebody gets anointed, they get arrogant. You understand the anointing is not to do with character. God will often hold an anointing back because the character is not ready, but he's such a God of grace that the gift of grace, the charisma, is there whether the character is there or not. And our job is to ensure that the character develops alongside the charisma. And we have many people in our national pulpits and international pulpits who are successful preachers, successful church growers, successful church planters, successful evangelists, and so forth. And they bring, carry big crowds and have big offerings, big ministries, and big egos. They're not meek. They become assertive. Even prayer for power can become assertive in the wrong way. When's the last time have you cried out to God for meekness to come to your life? Well, I've already been saying that these Beatitudes follow a logical order, and this awareness of uh, poverty of spirit, mourning for sin, naturally leads on to meekness. The first attitude is to admit your weakness and lack of ability. The second one is to, having recognized your poverty of spirit, to mourn for it. And the third attitude takes us further into God to point us to where we stop being concerned about ourselves 
and start getting concerned about other people. Meekness is your attitude towards other people. In many ways, you're quite happy to look at your own faults, but when somebody else comes and looks at your faults, you say, excuse me, no thank you. I've been in conversations when the very thing that somebody start, comes in the room to criticize somebody about, they were admitting to me in private. Oh, pastor, it's like this, it's like this. I should be doing more of this. And then somebody comes in and says, do you know it's been on my heart? You should have been doing this and this. I know you're wrong. And the person starts defending themselves. When a moment ago, they were admitting to me. Well, I, I said, what well, you do that for? Well, I, I couldn't let them know I felt like that. Well, there are two things that help us to live like that. And that's poverty of spirit and mourning. If we are truly poor in spirit and are mourning for our sin, there is no place to defend ourselves. No place to try to push ourselves up and make ourselves look or feel better than we are. Oh yes, we can boast in Christ Jesus. We can glory in the cross. But that is what I'm talking about. What is meekness? Jesus had the right to equality with God, but chose not to assert it and live the life of a slave instead. That's meekness. Meekness comes when you know your strength, and yet you refuse to assert it. It comes by being grateful and devoted and contented before God. It's a quiet spirit, a meek and quiet spirit. It means you are teachable, gentle, you're forgiving. In Philippians 4 verse 5, it says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. The Greek word for gentleness there is epiakes, which means it's coming from a word to yield. There's a yieldedness here. And it was actually used in the legal context of a willingness to take less than is your legal due in order to show meekness. And in a spiritual context, it's all of that and more for the sake of fearing God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of gentleness, meekness, considering yourself, lest you are also tempted. So meekness means that where you could assert yourself, and you think you are justified in doing so, but you don't. It often shows in your tongue. I heard a preacher say recently that he preaches against the tongue and the misuse of the tongue far more than even immorality. He thinks it's a more dangerous sin. Some people say the sex drive is the hardest thing to control and to bring un under the rule of God. Well, be that as it may. But James said, if anyone can control their tongue, they're a perfect man. If you can put your tongue under the control of the rule of God, you will be mighty advanced in the kingdom. And this preacher was saying it's easier to resist sexual urges than it is to resist saying what you really want to say, but you know you shouldn't. And it feels so good when you do, at the time, till you realize you've grieved the Holy Spirit. Now, meek people are patient people. They don't mind being overlooked or criticized. <laughs> so how meek are you? Do you mind being overlooked? Do you mind being criticized? Nobody likes being overlooked. Nobody likes being criticized. But meek people acknowledge that. They don't allow themselves to take priority. They give in to others. But meek, weak people are not... Meek people are not weak people. Rather, they are strong people who live gently. Just like Jesus. Strong man, wasn't he? But he lived gently. When the time came to it, he could empty the temple with a whip. But 
but mostly he was gentle. Didn't even raise his voice in the streets, it says. Meek people aren't foolish people who are easily conned or duped. They are wise people who respond humbly. They're not timid people who are afraid to speak up. They're often articulate people, but speak discreetly. They are not normal people who demand their own way. They are Jesus people who go God's way. John 13, verse 5. After that, Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel which he was, with which he was girded. That's meekness. Jesus, knowing he had come from the Father, knowing he was on his way back to the Father, took off his clothes, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. The Lord of glory washed feet. Extended his hands on the cross in meekness, allowing the nails to impale him into an agonizing death. And all the while said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's meekness. If we say we're following Jesus, we must follow him like that. Meek people do not worry about themselves or what people say about them. Really, truthfully, you might find this hard to take, but truthfully, there isn't anything that anyone can say which is bad enough for you or for me. I received some time ago a very critical letter. And... Uh, it wasn't an anonymous, if it's an anonymous letter, I don't read them, I throw them in the bin. Somebody graciously put their name at the bottom, which allowed me the opportunity to write back to them. And I thought, well, thank God, I've got this opportunity to write back to them. Now I can, uh, Holy Spirit said, you can what, Colin? I can de 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 defy my normal natural tendency. <laughs> and I read the letter. And you know, I thought the letter as critical as it was, and you probably wouldn't want me to be your teacher if you knew what they said about me. Uh, I, thought, I thought, well, it's not too bad, really. Could have been worse. Could have been much worse. In fact, I could have written a much worse letter about me than that. In fact, that's really quite praiseworthy by comparison. And God said, well, I could have written an even worse letter than that about you. So this isn't bad. So I wrote a letter back saying, thank you for the letter in which you have written pointing out certain aspects of my character and ministry. Unfortunately, I'd like to place on record that the person you describe bears absolutely no resemblance to me at all. I am far worse than you say. Yours sincerely. Well, it wasn't just a technique to write a clever letter back. Well, maybe just a bit of that. <laughs> but anyway, it was absolutely true. When you know your poverty of spirit, you aren't about to try and establish your own righteousness. And even if they falsely accuse you, they only falsely accused Jesus, didn't they? They did it to him, they'll do it to you. That's not saying that you should never ever speak up for yourself and stand up for, for what is correct and right, but it's the motive that we're talking about. If you pursue your own righteousness, you will not have God's righteousness. If you pursue your own vindication, you will not have God's vindication. God's righteousness and God's vindication of you may not happen on this earth. But it will happen in the earth which is to come. And not only will it happen in it, to you in it, it'll happen to you as you rule over it. If you're meek. If you're arrogant. 
always pointing the faults out of other people, always blaming other people, always shifting the blame from yourself, always retaliating. When it comes to that day, when the Heavenly Father announces the boundaries of where we are going to live and rule and reign with Christ in the future kingdom, over the earth which is to come, you will be in charge of a cabbage patch right down some back street somewhere. <laughs> truly, a truly meek disciple is always amazed that God thinks so highly of him. Amazing grace, Newton sang. And indeed, listen to this. It's this essential meekness that enables us to see and accept who we are in Christ. Because you know that God does not lie. And there is no shortcut to the throne. And in your heart of hearts, if you glorify yourself ahead of time without sacrificing on the cross, without turning away from sin, without humbling yourself before God and meekly accepting what he gives to you, you know you have got there in an illegitimate way and it is not rightfully your place. But when God lifts you up, when God promotes you, you then know who you are and you begin to see yourself who you are as who you are. Meekness is a prerequisite for you to understand who you are in Christ and the glorious exaltation he's given you that you might be raised with Christ and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Only meek people sit with Jesus on his throne and only meek people will judge the world and rule the earth in the future kingdom with Jesus. Well, that's the end of this session. Next session, we're going to pick it up from here and go straight on with these blessed attitudes, the Beatitudes. God bless you. I do hope that you've enjoyed this teaching on the kingdom of God today and that you've felt the power of God's kingdom in your life. After all, the kingdom of God is the only kingdom that is really worth extending, first of all, in your life and then through your life to the others around you. We'll be back next time for more teaching on the Kingdom of God.